Hello, how are you guys doing? Good. Everyone good? Are you guys excited to be here? Poetry, Friday night, what could be better? I, I'm Nick Courtright. I am the executive editor of Atmosphere Press, uh, Christy Pelliquin's publisher, uh, and I'm really excited to welcome you all here to this uh, awesome event at Melbourne Books, uh, which is a great place. It's always fantastic to be in this space. It's just a really uh, wonderful thing that we have here uh, in Austin for us. Uh, so I figure I'll go ahead and uh, introduce them each separately. Uh, we're very lucky uh, to have opening up for uh, Christy Mike Marshall, who's a fantastic Matthews. poet. Mike uh, Matthews. Matthews. Oh, my I'm off to a good start. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mike Matthews, uh, who I actually just found out he uh, teaches at uh, Central Texas College, where I also uh, teach, but he's a real teacher and I just do it online, so I'm just thinking. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's been teaching uh, college writing courses uh, at CTC. Uh, in Killeen, uh, which is up there, uh, since 2001. Uh, it says he's uh, sponsored the writing, Writers Club for Students in the Student Journal Byways since soon after he arrived to teach at the community college. Uh, between semesters, he's worked on his poetry. Uh, he's published several individual poems and has two collections in the final stages of development ready to be submitted to interested publishers such as Atmosphere Press. Um, so uh, I was talking to him, talking to him uh, before before this, uh, and he uh, mentioned that he plays a very intense saxophone, uh, and that some of his darker poems are reminiscent of that. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what that's all about. So without further ado, uh, Mike Matthews. Yeah, thank you. So I've been working on two projects, one of them I've been working on for years, um, and uh, finally was able to envision how to put it together. Um, a long time ago, I decided to try a, uh, a task, a challenge. I had always heard writers say, the thing that you are avoiding to write about is the thing that you should write about. which. I said, well, you're avoiding it for a reason. Yeah. So I went to my journals, stepping way back to 96 or 97, and I extracted everything intense and challenging and distorted and angry, or uh, maybe not so angry, but maybe angry, very intense. And uh, it, was, it wasn't easy. So I extracted it, I put it away for uh, several semesters, and then I typed it all out one summer, and now it's being shaped into poetry. And uh, the project so far has a working title, Distortions. And I brought <clears throat> what I call the core poems to, to this project. Um, the first one is called The 40-Minute Coma. Her obsidian shield inside eyelids raises against internal fists of tense iron ball weights. Under exhausted shoulders, eye sockets within eye sockets, over black sliver moons, fragmented greetings, loosely tied random responsibilities tucked into cluttered seconds. Her eyelids fall to slits. Eyes oscillate like a dark pendulum sped by nightmares fuel. Concave, sucked into a compressed clot of her past. When disappearing meant survival, a solid nowhere. The floor of a frozen black sea where voices tell lies. Fists of her childhood inside the shallow light cast shadows like masks of faces on the present. Where dark green jagged teeth cut her bloody, the dark blood of the dark past. Her eyes leap slowly, darkened to the past's abuses, mixing love and her rapes. No love, only her rape, her rape, her love, a shattered trust before trust. 
Rejection in a madness eats the present, eats the love, eats the affection, and feeds the death. Those teeth of shadows eat the candles. The flame is out, and inside the bath is murky gray. All those ghosts clamor to be recognized. The dream inside a dream, in heavy eyes rolling back. So, I've always told students, in order to write this stuff, you have to kind of get a distance from it. And when I started extracting it and working with it, it happened. Now I can see these as poetry. Um, and I'm able to work on them. So the next one is called, I Know What a Man Does. I know what a man does when he sees them go. I know the shock into immobility. I know the one place in bed where he lives, not venturing to encounter any of memory's ghosts who hide in other parts of the house. I know the pile of clothes and the pile of unopened mail that squeeze him into a corner of his mind. I know the corner of his bedroom that is no longer his, that belongs to some gray distance where he falls asleep after his body forces it on him and his night sweats slowly and makes the comforter smell like his deep dying. I know the phone calls he does not make. I know the trips to see his children he cannot take for fear of each bone detaching from one another when he hears their laughter in another backyard. And he falls to the floor in curls of his deepest pain. I know the loudest silence where his children no longer fight or cry, or bleed, or resist to put on their shoes, and the deepest silence of laughter that is no longer there. I know the cold house he parks next to, when the sun leaves and the desperate loneliness yawns at the front door like the rotting mouth of a deep void, waiting to let him slide in and close him into darkness. I know the mirror that slowly cracks to pieces on the floor over time, unnoticed until it no longer reflects anything or anyone until it becomes a simple gray torn paper wall. Um, these, these, were, these were a bit intense to work with, but uh, there's good news coming. <laughs> um, this one I brought to a, uh, I'm saying this on camera, a secret workshop group. Um, and they asked me one question. I don't remember the question. But in the question, I realized that the answer was in all the other poems. That was the moment that I can envision the book, uh, Distortions, a dark song. Um, this one is called, Whose Blackout Is This? <laughs> uh, I guess it should go in the center. No violins at night in absence of a caressing breeze. No windows left open in spring. Old aluminum frames easy for a thief to slip a screwdriver into our lives and pull away the illusions that our back brick walls paint. Each night pulls its hand away, kisses sleep another week. I'm the wandering passion. You are the broken forest, fortress, abandoned and falling to gravel and ruin. The crisis slow and cracking, under seas bowl cracked. Rippling waves like fists against the shores that love to hold you. Where are you so lost in an untouchable fear? Where's your gyroscope? I thought that I could ring like a void when the fog strangled you. You took the language of the green storm, and with your winds, I'm impaled on your sharpened cliffs, spires of your nights. When the bridge falls, its cord ties, and anchor columns crack too. My children, your children, without oars, 
No way to navigate their shattering glass worlds, the dying of their rock back family, the empty chairs at the dinner table in their empty evenings, fabrics and patterns like the matrix of expectations taint the probable. I thought I was the antidote, but I took the poison of denial. I have three more from that project, and then move into what I call the sunrise. <laughs> um, so this one is called the under the over sadness. Under the over sadness, a brief hibernation of the senses, how easy it is to block the continuous feed of light by will. Though it does not seem like a choice at all. Darkness is like an encroaching stone added to disharmony, scattered backwards to a stench filled, bog dark crack in the shadows. Leave off my simple lamp, for it's all I have to drink. It's the light I allow, the rest would shock. Allow my dip stream and divert the black ink river around my island where I may light a lamp fire from the driftwood I drag from the maw of darks yawning. The flame will burn so green and make a dis dis decent warmth enough in the narrow cone of the lamplight's green, green fire with sparks like bees that sting with fetal stings to dark fingers that pinch their brief fires. I do not have enough confidence to swallow all of the beauty around me. Staring into the light bulb would burn out my eyes. I'll be contented with the lamp's cover and how the light shines on the tops of my hands. Black oil river of dark, I would love to find the match that would ignite you like the Hudson. I've hidden it somewhere in my mind with code scribbled in ash on its vault doors. The ego of passion that puts the mask of compassion to its eyes and smiles its backward dance of joy should be afraid of how I'm cradled in the lamplight with no threats but my own. Um, this one, this one was an initial kind of insight into this into this one, it's this project. Um, I'm not sure how I can explain how, but it, it just kind of was one of the first ones that took shape and made sense as a poem, where I think this kind of project is for defining the difference between being able to see in the dark and being able to see the dark. This is to see the dark. And I think if, you, if, if a poem can show that, then the dark loses some of its power. You can see the dark. Seeing in it, you're still in it. But if you see it, and you can see it, that's it. <laughs> Something happens to it. It doesn't like it. That's the lamp. This one's called, What Time Is The Sun? What time is the sun? Gathering clouds over moody children, so effective without me, with my empty hand full of my empty cup. The wasted hour of morning, five miles of sweat, the beginning of fall, my skin's strength keeps me distracted without saying a word. Having produced fathers and mothers I'll never meet, will some molecule deep within them whisper questions in my voice? The sun cools ten degrees. Autumn bends the light, yellow, to lick the leaves raw. My thoughts leak from a loose hose, dripping into a planter's saucer, for the larva squirming in the soil. I'm too empty to buy bread. Uh, one more from this one, and then I will prompt the Nice story of what uh, sparked the next one. This one's called, this one's 
actually published in an anthology. We have another writer circle up in Central Texas. Uh, Christy came up and read to us. Um, we have a big diner called Little Texas, and we get our own little room, and it has metal stars on the wall. And we read poetry to each other and eat hash browns. <laughs> and, and it's pretty awesome. It's like, it's like being in a Vonnegut novel or something. It's, but uh, it works, right? It's, yeah, it's like the cool little group. Yeah, it's championships on the wall. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. It's a completely quiet little town up there called Copper's Cove where nothing happens but loud trucks and motorcycles. And, and we are in a diner reading all this poetry to each other and, and publishing our own anthologies. This one is called A Day That Fell Between Minutes. It's on Amazon, I think, yeah. There was a day sometime today, I'm almost sure I saw it. Where could I have put it? Did I leave it in the ATM? Had it been in the blueberries I did not order in the pancakes I had with my children late in the afternoon? When I coughed after the family went to bed and I filled the car with gasoline, could I have tossed it in the trash with the hospital blue towel I used to check the level of the engine oil? I got it. Yes, the day must have been after the cereal bowls were returned to the kitchen and after I discovered that quite a bit of milk remained in each. No, the day took its Zoloft and got lost in hyperventilation purple. Or it left the emergency brake on for four and one half miles across town while I searched for ska, blues, jazz on the scanner dial radio. I remember opening the door to toss a fingernail I had torn from my pinky. The window does not slide down. Its arm is broken which could be where the day hit itself. There were eulogies on the radio, eloquent and intelligent, that I did not hear. So I'm not surprised that I could have missed the day or that it may have sat in a black limousine out of the rain and watched me from behind tented windows as I breathed and chased each minute like they were fireflies, blinking, blinking, blinking green. Thanks. Uh, this last summer, I went back to China. I'm an in-law of a city there, Honga. My spouse, and she Mary, are also an in-law of a city in China. And uh, one morning, uh, I said, I don't want to sleep in. I need to follow my intuition and go sit on the steps at the temple. I don't know why I didn't want to sleep in. It was a brutal semester last year. But I did. I followed my gut. And uh, a lot of really of just simple and profound moments occurred after that. And they're still occurring. Um, the, uh, the, the headmaster of the temple read one of my poems. The one I'm going to read to you now that was translated in Chinese. And after that, he invited me to some other very important, very old temples where we, um, we all went and stayed and learned meditation. And um, all of those little encounters between the master and the student that I read about since I was 19, where they take your questions and they make them unimportant. And then you wake up to something and you're not quite sure what it is. Those things are real. It's, and I'm still trying to figure out what that means. But they are. I was being a, I'm, I'm, I'm originally an Austinite, which means, you know, as you can tell me. Um, I typed out a message for him and I said, you know, it's very strange that um, here I come from all the way across the world and I sit in this temple and I'm sitting across from you having tea and eating and uh, and uh, I feel like I've, I'm right at home. I, I feel like, why should I feel at home? This is, I don't, I don't even know what anybody's saying. I don't know Chinese. So it's, it's odd. I feel right at home. And he, he read it. He you know, you know some English. And he looked up and he said, oh, yeah, me too. So I had gone there and I sat on a step and I listened to them uh, 
the, they were doing a ceremony and chanting, and it, and and there was a lot of stuff going on last year, and it pulled it up. And I wrote this poem, and this is a poem that is uh, the center of the next piece, the next project. The working title of that book is called The Water of Joy, which is what the monks want to call me now. They want to you, your name should be The Water of Joy. This one is called The Water of Joy. Angua is the name of the temple, and Su means temple. Did I say it right? Okay, good. The chanting at Angua Su reaches deeply into timelessness, foregoes a need for understanding. Small white butterflies float above tiny magenta flowers the size of fingerprints. I am in between me and not me. I am not a father. I am a father. I am not a husband. I am a husband. I am not me. I am me. No reason in a heartbeat of an old human chant without time, without development of time, the heartbeat of the soul, of energy, of voice, the keeper of the mind is the heart, the silence of reason. The mantra pulls from the deep well of sorrow to drink the water of joy. Awesome, thanks. Um, we went to have lunch and uh, Headmasters in Chonggi. I kept apologizing, the electricity was out, but they don't really air condition much in the way. So. There's no breeze at all, and it's very hot. So he got concerned, and he said, after we ate, he said, you might want to go down there and uh, go see the bridge, a 600 year bridge, 600 year old bridge. Uh, there may be a breeze down there. And so I walked down there and uh, took pictures of the bridge, and I posted them on Facebook, and a friend of mine said, so was there a breeze or not? <laughs> and so I wrote this poem. It's called The Question of the Breeze. Let me say that I have lost a few pounds in sweat alone. There either was a breeze, or there was not a breeze. With the heat coming from above and from below, radiating from concrete and added the magnificence of walking across a bridge like this one, pausing to look onto the rice fields, across the tops of flowers, and a stream, to a mountain across the valley, the field full of green is enough to cancel one's desire for a breeze. <laughs> long, interesting lecture and conversation with another monk who insists on being called Sunshine because his name sounds like Sunshine. And uh, Chung Di likes to call his name out because when he learned, you like to be called Sunshine? So now when I, he says, Sunshine, where are you? And he gives him a hard time. But the, he's been egging me on to continue writing. He sends me pictures of the temple, the similar construction, and videos of them watering the tree that's growing out of the top of the 800-year-old tower. Because he knows it's going to uh, cause me to write poetry, and I write him back. But I told him, when I swim, that's when I meditate. He said, ah, so he gave me a long, interesting lesson on Chang, which is Zen. And then I came home, and I swam, and I wrote this poem. Between air and water. Today I breathe between air and water. I breathe into the water. Out to breathe. I turn and breathe in the air. Out to breathe. I turn and breathe in the air. Tiny blue square tiles mark distance like frames around random instances of distances, neither forward nor backward. The tiles form a long letter I. I glide between air and water, neither forward nor backward. 
The air pressure pushes me down, the water pressure holds me up. The line between air and water shines like a ribbon of silver. I am between water and air, like I, like I am between birth and death, gliding along the silver line, breathing in the air and transferring air to the water, breathing out the air and transferring water to the air. I turn and swim, turn and swim, each stroke along the long letter I. No beginning, no end. We got to hang out at this really awesome temple called Buzutsu and see these, uh, these amazing things that are just, just very difficult to describe. Um, and I hung out a little bit in the, um, there's some open space. And there's a forest off to the side and the cicadas are intense. They make this high, pitch sound that sounds like a, a constant uh, fan belt, you know. And so I went out there and I sat on one of the uh, the four little elephants which are supposed to be on and just listened to them. And uh, I wrote this, it's called Cicada Song. The cicadas must think their song of the forest is more important than my deepest thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> in Florida, uh, he used to teach with y'all at uh, ACC, he used to talk astronomy, John Blum, and uh, he used to, we used to hang out and uh, he knew that he could like edge me towards poetic epiphany, I guess, by explaining black holes to me and things like that. <coughs> he's been sending me, uh, uh, he's retired now, so he's hanging out, having a good time in Florida. Um, he keeps sending me these poems by Milarepa and all these things, kind of evoking these responses. And this, yeah, Milarepa will evoke his responses. <laughs> this is one of them. Uh, to see in autumn. Sometimes the nectar of the mind, like slowly flowing illustrious amber, bends the light like an autumn's noon. Calm and yellow, a translucent eyeball sliding across the days and down the trees, absorbing everything and holding on to nothing. Lightly striving to forget itself, like water. Sometimes the sun stalks the mind, lighting up everything with powerful whispers about expanding behind the sunset. Sometimes the mind might stop trying to see inside the sunset and blink for a moment, one breath long, like waking from a dream of fall, to see a red leaf carried gently by the wind. I am so grateful to have been invited to do this, uh, to warm up for Christy. Um, it's, it's been really cool preparing for this. Um, just, I just really love it. Thank you for this. Uh, I have one more. Um, when we were about to leave and come back to the States, um, we went back and I went back up the spiral of concrete stair steps into the tower with uh, a friend. He's a friend now. I met there. And there were more of us going up the tower and stopping and looking at things. This time I could understand the explanations because I some translation. Last time I knew enough to answer, to ask questions, knew enough Chinese to ask questions, but that's not a good idea if you don't understand all the answers, because <laughs> um, I couldn't understand anything. But I, I noticed that we all went up and we were, we were doing our temporary parting until next time, and I wrote this one called Circles Never End. We completed a circle, first as strangers, from opposite sides of the earth, climbing an old tower whose steps are worn smooth by thousands of meetings like ours. We struggle to merge our languages, finding similarity that each step 
reaching a view of the long river under a miraculous tree. How funny fate can be. How it reunites a family across a sea, across a culture, across a language, across time, across no space at all. We climbed the stairs again with added family. When it was time to depart, seeking a stone with the words we carved in our past lives. There is no beginning, there is no departure. The statues and the stones chip and fade. The flower lamps softly burn. We will always refill the oil. <laughs> Thank you so much.